There's little doubt that the coastal redwood is truly a wonder of nature. Being awestruck in the presence of the tallest trees on earth is to be expected. It's an experience open to everyone, young and old, one you've probably experienced today. But for the scientists studying Sequoia sempervirens, the coastal redwood takes on a whole new magnitude of wonder. Take water. All trees absorb water in their roots and transport it up through the trunk and limbs to the crown. In fact, the ability to passively transport water up is one of the main factors that governs how tall a tree can grow. It stands to reason that the tallest trees on the planet are very good at this. But coastal redwoods supplement this mechanism in some very interesting ways. First is fog drip. During our drier California summers, as temperatures rise inland, coastal fog is pulled on shore. As the marine layer drifts through the redwood forest, the limbs and needles in the upper reaches of the canopy comb moisture from the passing fog. The water condenses on the needles and falls to the forest floor below. This is fog drip. And researchers are learning that it is an important source of summertime sustenance for the coastal redwood, not to mention the rest of the forest. At the same time, as the needles comb the fog for condensation, recent research shows that some of the water is actually absorbed in the canopy itself, which is not how a tree is supposed to work. Redwoods can also sprout root-like protuberances in their canopies to tap into the moisture and minerals found in the sometimes massive mats of duff and fern that collect on upper branches. This ability to take in water and minerals at both ends might explain how Sequoia sempervirens can grow taller than a 30-story building. In your journey along the Redwood Highway, you've no doubt seen the many artisans working with burl. Prized for its unique grain and coloration, burl wood is highly sought after, and anything that can be fashioned from wood can be fashioned more beautifully from Redwood burl. But you want to know the single most beautiful thing that can be created from a redwood burl? A redwood tree. Like so much having to do with Sequoia sempervirens, the story of the redwood burl and just what it means to the surprisingly resilient life cycle of the coast redwood only gets more wondrous with each telling. Like all conifers, the coast redwood reproduces by producing male cones and female cones. A single redwood tree will take care of both sides of the equation, the end result being the production of thousands of pollinated female cones every year, each containing around 60 seeds. These seeds are dispersed and drift down to the forest floor, each hoping for a specific set of salubrious circumstances in order to become a mature redwood tree. And the odds are stacked against them. It's thought that perhaps one seed out of a million dispersed will actually grow into maturity. Thankfully, the coast redwood has adapted another way of ensuring the continuation of the species, and it's really cool. As a redwood grows, so grows a mass of dormant stem tissue near the base of the trunk. These knot-like structures vary widely in size, with the smallest perhaps only the size of a baseball. The largest can weigh several thousand pounds. They have a redder coloration, different surface texture, and an often variegated grain pattern. This is a burl. But what is truly magical about a redwood burl is that each one is chock full of nascent redwood sprouts. Ordinarily, these sprouts remain dormant, but if something untoward should happen to the tree, fire, wind damage, even logging, hormones present in the burl stem tissue trigger the emergence of the sprouts. And each one of these sprouts could become a mature redwood tree. And what's more, when compared to the relative travails of a seedling, Burl sprouts have a better chance of becoming a mature redwood because they're part of the parent tree. In fact, genetically, they are the parent tree. They have immediate access to the larger tree's extensive root system and can grow more easily with less light and fewer surface nutrients. Now that's a leg up on life. Near the Brotherhood Station, you can find a striking example of a redwood burl doing its job. The towering inferno tree was struck by lightning on a stormy night back in the 70s. Because of the rain, it was the only tree that burned that night, but burn it did, leaving a broken snag that has aged beautifully over the years. Passing its base, you might think this dramatic relic was nothing more, just a tree that used to be. 
but follow the walkway and peer inside the broken redwood husk and you'll find a young, slender redwood tree emerging from the basal burrow, doing all it can to reach the light and open air above. Often, a damaged tree will sprout a close grouping or ring of burl sprouted offspring that remain after the parent tree has been removed or simply rotted away over eons. These groupings are called fairy rings, and once you know what they look like, you'll see them everywhere in the trees of mystery. In fact, the next couple wedded before the towering majesty of our own cathedral tree will be standing in a partial fairy ring, a silent reminder not just of nature's stupendous beauty, but also to the tree's own progenitor, now long gone, to whom they are each genetically identical. And that's the coolest thing about a redwood burl. This asexual regeneration can go on for millennia, each subsequent generation growing, literally, from the one before it, genetically identical, an unbroken lineage that could last a million years or more. Which means that many of the redwoods in the living forest all around you are much older than even their rings might attest. See, as with so many aspects of the mighty, impressive, nearly eternal Sequoia Sempervirens, the story gets more wondrous with each telling. <laughs>